Hello, and welcome back to the afternoon session of today's meeting. If you would take your seats, I'd appreciate it because um, we'd like to get started since uh, we are going to break for coffee on time because there are um, competing events at, at that time. So we'll have our regular scheduled coffee break, but there'll be extra time because of your sticks um, unavailability that we can f work a little bit more conversation in after, um, after the end of the afternoon's talks. Um, I'd like to thank Tiarna and Chris for the work that they've done in organizing this. Um, Tiarna is associated with the painting specialty group of ICOM CC and Austin uh, Nevin, who's been working with Tiarna and Chris, um, is associated with the science working group of the ICOM CC. And uh, I hope that you will speak to them during the um, cocktail hour this evening about ICOM and its activities and how you would like to be involved with um, it, specifically with their working groups. They'll have the best information on that. Um, I've also been uh, given the green light to take a little bit of your time to announce a couple of flyers that are on the registration table that uh, we, were, we brought from the National Gallery. One is the announcement of our new technical journal, which is called Facture, which is designed to appeal to conservators, art historians, and conservation scientists, blending all of the ways of looking at a, a work of art into one essay. And there are several essays in, this, in the inaugural volume, which is available from Yale University Press. And the information about that volume is all there on that flyer. The second flyer that we've put out is the very beginnings of an initiative to create dialogue and build strength on the U.S.-Italy uh, relationship, which this um, initiative began last year in 2013, which was the uh, beginning of, uh, was for the year of the Italian-U.S. relationship. And from a conference that was held in um, October, the notion of working better and leveraging our strengths was was started. And what we've begun is just to try to establish places where we can put information that will help foster those relationships. And we've started with a very small step, which is locating the kinds of places that young researchers can go for postdoctoral uh, help to support studying in, in each other's countries, and also for exchanges. And most of those are through the NSF program. And what I'd like to do is ask you, as you become aware of these kinds of things, to maybe send them those pieces of information to me so that we can help disseminate that and strengthen the uh, ties between our efforts in, in US and Italy, and of course, other countries too. So with uh, business over, almost over, um, I have just a couple more things to say. After Bruno Brunetti's talk, um, Chris will say a few words, and uh, Francesca Casadio will come up to the podium to talk about some of the initiatives that she is uh, organizing uh, in Chicago and in, uh, over the summer at the Gordon Conference. So with that, and after a very heady morning, we're, we're moving on. I think things are, are tremendously uh, exciting here. We've got a, quite a few interesting and different topics we're going to cover. The first talk is uh, going to be given by two of the um, four co-authors. The authors are Gwendolyn Fife, Basha Stabik, Tyler Meldrum, and Bernhard Blumich. And Gwen and Tyler are going to share the podium for that presentation. Um, their talk is titled, Evidence for the Accumulative Effect of Organic Solvent Treatments on Paintings and What to Do About It a case study of two identical 17th century paintings with single-sided NMR. And um, I'll just give you a little bit of the background that explains how they are able to work this uh, interesting and uh, fraught topic together. Gwen is the senior paintings conservator and rese uh, researcher at Schral in Maastricht. She's a chemistry graduate from York University and completed her graduate training in painting conservation at the Courtauld Institute of Art. She was a Mellon Fellow nearby in Baltimore at the Walters Art Museum and has worked in many conservation centers, museums, and in private practice in Europe and in America. In 2005, Gwen started working at Schral, where she performs technical research and undertakes treatment projects and 
takes part in collaborative investigations. And her co-presenter here, Tyler Meldrum, received his PhD in chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley. There he worked with, as he says, large magnets and exotic gases, and later turned his attention to small magnets and art. And uh, by taking, and the first step to that was a postdoc research position at RWTH in Aachen in Germany. And there he developed techniques for portable magnetic resonance devices, and he says, think miniature MRI, to study uh, methods in cultural heritage conservation and restoration. In 2013, Tyler became an assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry at the College of William and Mary, where he continues to work with portable MRI in cultural heritage. So, come on up. Thank you. So, I'm starting first. Um, this talk is a result of collaboration discussions between Renny Hoppenbrauers, which is Sorrell's director, and Bernard Blumich, a professor at RWTH Aachen University. We're very grateful to them for setting that up. I hope you will be too after this talk. Um, Tyler Meldrum came to Sorrell. He explained the principles of NMR to me and talked about some of his previous work. There appeared to be a potential with single-sided NMR to comparatively study the effects of different varnish removal techniques with organic solvents, which is an area of particular and ongoing interest to us at Sral. Previous research on oil paint films and organic solvent effects has been highly beneficial in developing our conceptual modeling of oil paint films and organic solvents, as well as showing potentially long-term negative effects of the solvents. Critical for us to know is whether these effects can be influenced by relatively simple adaptations in the way we apply solvents and remove varnishes. Hence, our initial and, uh, initial and ongoing experiments were with this objective in mind. And we will share our current findings in the second part of this talk. But by a lucky coincidence, two very interesting paintings had come to Sral prior to this. As a case study with the NMR, these demonstrated the potentially major effects of natural resin varnishing and varnish removal. They gave new perspectives for our research, and it is our findings from these paintings that will be a main focus of our presentation today. But first, I'm going to give a very brief background on varnishing and removal. Given what we're about to see with this case study, perhaps we first need a little reassurance. Why do we do it? Varnishes are natural or synthetic resins, generally in organic solvents. And we apply these by brush or spray to the paint surface. Varnishes provide saturation of the paint layers, can provide an isolation layer, and can often play a critically protective role for a painting. However, natural resin varnishes oxidize, they darken, and yellow. This obviously affects our visual appreciation of the painting, and also, oftentimes, the conservation of the original materials themselves. And so removal of old varnishes remains a common treatment, and in this, organic solvents remain a reliable tool. But varnish removal involves risk assessment. One risk factor which preoccupies us conservators is that we know solvents can cause physical and chemical changes in paint films. It's not about visually observable changes during treatment, we can avoid those of course, but rather subtle long-term effects. Effects indicated by some of the above mentioned research and observed in our practical experiences when examining previously treated paintings. But whilst we may have our suspicions about how much a painting's current appearance is due to previous varnishings and removals, the individuality of each painting, the complexity of its structure, and the number of unknowns within its lifetime means it's not possible to directly correlate the treatment history with current condition. To do that, a real painting control would be ideal. In other words, two paintings made a long time ago by the same artist with the same materials and techniques at the same time, with the only difference being one had been treated and the other had never been Sorry, one had never been treated, and the other had been varnished and cleaned. But what are the chances of that? Well, in 2011, two paintings from the Fries Museum in Leovarden came into Sral as part of a treatment project for 24 paintings in the collection. They were compositionally very similar, as you can see in the animation here, showing the two paintings, uh, showing a superimposing of the two painting images. They were both dated 1616 and had an identical provenance. Called the dinner and the dance, they depicted the Pippin Poy's wedding, 
and were known to have hung in the big hall in the Liakuma estate in Friesland until the estate was demolished, going in 1963 to the Fries Museum. Initial observations indicated they were apparently by the same artist, made at the same time, but there were dramatic visual and tactile differences. Apart from local tear repairs in the dinner, the only structural treatments for both paintings had involved restretching. Regarding the surfaces, the dinner had been varnished with natural resins and cleaned, although unevenly, at least twice. And there were numerous overpaints visible above the first varnish layer, which are highlighted in red on the uppermost, lay uppermost left image. Whereas with the dance, there was, amazingly, no indications its surface had ever been treated. There were very obvious differences between the paintings. The surface of the dance was covered in surface dirt, and the uppermost paint was powdery and fragile. But apart from this, and the mechanical damages caused by previous folding, the paint and ground layers had an excellent condition overall, and there was also a noticeable lack of cracking in the body of the paint of the dance. Whereas in the dinner, that which was treated, there were typical cracks in the paint film across the surface. It was also more glossy and saturated, of course, and appeared more brittle. Regarding the canvases, the canvas of the dance was super flexible. It was lighter in color. There was clearly less oxidation of fibers and no resin residues, of course. In the dinner, the canvas was embrittled and there was evidence of resin throughout the structure. Resin residues could be observed in cracks on the reverse. Now, there was no additional funding for research, but the museum was very supportive of any further technical investigations we could carry out at SRAL, and we were naturally keen to further study this unique opportunity. Did we really have a 400-year-old control? The canvas supports of each painting comprise two canvases with similar weave counts with a central seam. In the dance, since there was one painted turnover edge with original threading holes and self edge, we could calculate a loom size of 110 centimetres. There was also a series of holes related to one stretcher prior to the current. In the dinner, all the sides had been cut and the painting had been made smaller and there had been two stretchings prior to the current stretcher. But measurements indicated the paintings could have had the same size stretchers after painting, and there were no preparation differences visible in infrared. Twelve samples were removed from each painting from comparable areas. They showed the same painting technique, same layer buildup, and pigment composition. Staining tests indicated the paint medium in both paintings to be oil. XRF of both painting surfaces was carried out, and two samples from each painting was removed from comparative areas on the painting for elemental mapping in the EDX. These analyses further confirmed an identical pigment palette, lead white, vermilion, red lead, earth pigments, carbon black, and calcium carbonate in the ground. And I, I want to point out here that the samples for these analyses were removed from the same area that would be examined with the NMR. Furthering exa further examining the samples in the SEM, there were differences observable within the paint and ground layers. In that from the dinner, there were cracks, fissures, and pores visible at this magnification, and layers also appeared less discreet. Depth profiling was also carried out on these samples prior to the SEM edX, using our analytical light microscope in preparation for the NMR examinations. But before getting to that, are we living up to the title? Do we have identical paintings? Well, I think we proved beyond reasonable doubt we had the same artist, the same original materials, the same date, and the same painting technique. And could we attribute the differences solely to varnishing and varnish removal? Well, regarding the evidence of treatment history, yes. But there remain questions about how much specific environmental history may have played a role. So our, for our further conclusions regarding this, single-sided NMR proved a valuable technique. So I will pass on to Tyler now, who will give a brief description of how NMR can be used and how it was applied to these paintings. Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, NMR, has been a chemist's tool of choice for several decades. In an NMR experiment, a sample is placed in a large homogeneous magnetic field, and the response to that field is measured, producing a spectrum, shown here at the top. Interpretation of that spectrum reveals the structure of the molecule of interest, in this case, a triglyceride. While chemical identification of compounds is tremendously powerful, the technique is not an analytical panacea. One particularly pertinent drawback illustrated here is the size of the sample. 
Most magnets accommodate samples only millimeters across, not entire paintings. If we reduce an NMR apparatus to its simplest components, we need just three things. A sample, a magnet, and a radio frequency coil, or an antenna. Thinking back to our primary school days, iron filings can show the field produced by a magnet. If two or more magnets are cleverly arranged next to each other, like so, the field between them can be made fairly flat and homogeneous in a region that is itself above the magnets. This offset of the magnets themselves and their magnetic field allows for an unconventional geometry of an NMR experiment, one in which the sample sits atop rather than within the device. One such device, shown here at the lower right, is um, about six inches by six inches by four inches, weighs approximately 10 pounds. With this and other single-sided magnets, samples of arbitrary geometry can be analyzed, but there is at least one significant drawback. The field homogeneity is not good enough to give chemical information. However, one can still use single-sided magnets to, pro to probe the physical properties of a material. The sensitive region of the magnet, the volume from which we make our measurements, has an area of approximately one square inch and an adjustable thickness of between 10 and 500 microns for a total sample volume of up to 0.3 milliliters. In addition, it is positioned between one and five millimeters above the surface of the magnet, shown here. If one were to suspend a sample just above the magnet but below the sensitive region, so shown there in blue, and makes repeated measurements while moving the magnet down, you can see here you would produce a signal profile which is a function of the, of the signal intensity uh, versus the position through the, the depth of the sample. Single-sided NMR measurements produce data at each depth that may look something like this curve here shown in red. From this example curve, one can extract two significant parameters, the signal amplitude and the rate of signal decay. The signal amplitude, designated A, tells us how much proton-containing material is in the measured location while the rate of signal decay, designated T2, indicates the strength of the intermolecular network. In samples with a small value of T2, or a very rapid signal decay, there is a strong intermolecular network, often associated with a stiff or a brittle material. A large T2, by contrast, with a slow signal decay, may suggest a softer material. With the ability to probe the sample stiffness at different depths without sampling the painting, we began an investigation of the dinner and the dance. A single measurement point on the wallpaper of the dance, marked in red, was selected, and the signal intensity here on this top plot and the T2 on the bottom plot were measured at 15 micron increments across the thickness of the painting. Also shown here in the red and yellow overlay, um, we have indicated the approximate thickness of the different layers. The signal intensity is somewhat variable uh, throughout the thickness of, uh, throughout the measurement, but Perhaps more interesting is what we observe in the T2. We have a linear gradient of T2 values where we have small T2 values near the surface of the painting, uh, increasing towards larger T2 values near the rear of the painting. That suggests a gradient of stiffness throughout the painting. A similar examination of the dinner shows an interesting comparison. When measured under the same experimental conditions and at a similar position on the wallpaper, again marked in red, the dinner reveals a somewhat variable signal amplitude, like before, but a very different T2 profile. The T2 value is small and constant over approximately 500 microns at the surface of the painting, and then increases dramatically in the canvas region. This suggests a uniformly stiff material throughout most of the painting with an abrupt softening near the rear surface. To compare the two results, the dance has a gradient of stiffness throughout the painting, while the dinner is uniformly stiff, as stiff as, it, as at any point in the dance throughout. We posit that the, that the stiffness gradient in the dance supports the idea of a natural oxidation process. Paint near the surface has greater exposure to the atmosphere and its concomitant oxidizers, while paint further from the surface experiences less of the atmosphere's oxidative effects. The constant T2 value throughout the thickness of the previously treated dinner painting supports no such claim. I'll turn it back over to Gwen for some more interpretation. So regarding our further interpretations, 
Well, firstly, the NMR data correlated well with the data from our other technical examinations. The dance paint was stiffer at the very surface of the paint film, with then a smooth gradient of decreasing stiffness through depth of ground, and as Tyler says, this fits with an oxidation gradient we would expect in an aged oil paint. Whereas in the dinner, paint and ground layers showed equal stiffness throughout their entire depth, with that being the same as the surface stiffnesses of both paintings. The fact that the dinner and the dance are equally stiff at the surface is a critical fact. We would expect to see effects of environment, so storage, hanging conditions, as relatively, see different effects of environment, so different storage, hanging conditions, as relatively increased oxidation in the uppermost surface of paint layers. We could therefore tentatively conclude that despite the specific environmental unknowns, differences within the body of the paint and ground layers were therefore most likely attributable to varnish solvent-related treatment differences. The data from the ground and canvas layers gave a strong indication of the effect of the resin residues on the mechanical differences evident between the two paintings. In the dance, there was a gradual gradient in decreasing stiffness from the ground through to the back of the canvas, from 0.4 milliseconds around the ground canvas interface to 0.6 milliseconds at the back of the canvas. In the dinner, this was a much steeper and curved gradient from 0.2 milliseconds around the interface of the canvas with the ground layer, in other words, stiffer, to 0.8 milliseconds at the back of the canvas. Comparing regions of just canvas in both paintings, we see an increased stiffness in the dinner in the just canvas region approaching the ground. Considering natural resins are unstable and brittle stiff materials, it's then obvious to conclude that the introduction of natural, natural resin varnishes was a major factor in stiffening the layers throughout almost the entire depth of the dinner. On one hand, not an accumulative effect, but one major one. But less obvious, and yet more pertinent to our ongoing practices, is that in subsequent removals, solvents can serve, and in this case could have served, to increase penetration of those resins into the paint, ground, and canvas. This means potentially a cumulative effect, not only from the solvents, but also from the resin residues. In this case study, we could not further quantify the individual contribution of resin and solvent, but in practice, the two factors also always go together. When removing varnishes with solvents, we can see that the manner and technique we use de determines how much solvent penetrates the painting, how effectively the resins are removed, and whether resin residues can flow further into the painting. Here on the left, you can see a wet spot on the back of the canvas. where free solvent is applied to the paint surface when a swab. The solvent has immediately penetrated through to the back of the canvas. And you can also see residues of varnish that remain in the paint cracks using this application method. Whereas on the right, when the solvent has been thickened and applied using Strahl's gel composite technique, the solvent no longer penetrates to the verse, and varnish residues are more fully removed from the paint cracks. That's the paint crack here, and that's the one with free solvent. So all good? Well, perhaps. The case study here, demonstrating as it does, the relatively extreme effect of resin varnishes and their residues makes it clear there are big questions. Can the resin effects be halted? Are they irreversible? Should this be a more weighty consideration in our varnish removal treatments? Would different treatment approaches to try and remove resin from the entire structure be beneficial? And what accompanying risk is acceptable from the solvent exposure factor? Or in other words, what are the invisible effects when we change our, ap our solvent application methods? <coughs> Can relatively simple adaptations in our varnish removal techniques with organic solvents, such as this one, make a difference? Can we thereby influence the cumulative, in other words, long-term effects of solvents in paint films? And so, with an eye ultimately on the other big issues, we come to our initial experiments with the NMR. Oh, I missed the slide, sorry. There we go, that was about the last about the invisible effects and other big issues. And uh, now we come back to our continuing experience with NMR. On the plus side, single-sided NMR proved a useful analytical tool in this case to better understand changes and the locations of those changes within the painting structure. However, on the negative, the layer structure and thicknesses of real paintings are variable, making it difficult to carry out accurate depth profiling for such studies. Tests on a real painting fragment, for instance, proved initially too complex, with its varying depth across the surface and its multiple varnishes. 
From other authors' research, we know the differences affected by careful varnish removal solely as a result of solvent exposure are likely to be subtle. And as we also had to work out how to do those studies with the NMR, we wanted to start with something simple we could fully characterise and where we knew we should see effect, solvent effects, otherwise we can't compare them, of course. And so we selected a model. This comprises a single ground layer on a linen canvas, naturally aged 10 years with no varnish. We carried out depth profiling and through simple swab tests selected a solvent which indicated a large potential swelling effect for this film. We are initially just comparing two techniques for accumulative solvent effects, swabs with free solvent and a variant of Strahl's tissue gel composite method which is basically a thickened solvent applied in the tissue with a secondary absorbent tissue step. Our plan has been to do repeated intermittent treatments with the model exposed to each method for the same amount of time, and that is just until visual effects can be observed. We've been carrying out gravimetric studies alongside to determine how much solvent has entered the model with each application method. And now I will pass over to Tyler again to give some more explanation and present our initial results from the NMR. To re recap what Gwen just said about our experimental conditions, uh, small pieces of the canvas plus red ground model were measured using single-sided NMR. Uh, we report measurements on two pieces of the model, each measured both before and after treatment with a solvent. The difference, again, is in the method for applying the solvent, one with a free solvent with a swab, and the other method is with as Sorrell's uh, tissue gel comp composite method. All experiments were conducted with a spatial resolution of 50 microns and were run overnight. Uh, gravimetric tests suggest that solvent evaporation during these long experiments does not significantly affect the results. A representative data set produced by these long measurements is best depicted in three dimensions. One to indicate the depth or position of measurement, one for the time of the decaying signal, and one for the signal intensity. With this data set, the parameters A and T2 can be determined at each posi position in the sample, as was done previously. Not all data sets can be correctly fitted with a simple exponential decay curve. Some samples show behavior that can only be modeled by bi or tri-exponential equations, reflecting the number of measurable relaxation modes present in a sample. While some algorithms can be applied to predict the number of exponentials that should be present in the best model, the algorithms themselves are highly unstable. We prefer to fit our data with the fewest number of exponential functions that completely reflect the decay in the signal, evaluated by minimizing the absolute deviation of the residuals from the fit. The data treatment of these experiments deserves a brief, a brief explanation. We are interested in seeing only the effect that the treatment has made on the sample. To that end, data for measurements made before treatment are fitted with the appropriate functions and parameters A and T2 are extracted at each position. These fitted data curves are subtracted from the raw data of measurements made after the treatment, generating a data set that shows the effect of only the treatment itself. Then these data points are fitted and parameters A and T2 extracted at each position. The top set of plots is the signal amplitudes of the sample that was treated with the free solvent, both before on the left and after on the right treatment. The bottom plots are the same, but for the tissue gel composite method. In each plot, the solid lines are surrounded by a shaded area, indicating the fit parameter and the 95% confidence interval, respectively. For both the free solvent and the tissue gel composite treatment, the before measurements on the left appear to be very similar a signal amplitude of comparable intensity, and a T2 value of between 100 and 200 microseconds. I note that I'm not plotting the T2 values on this slide just to maintain clarity in the presentation. The after treatments on the right reveal an interesting comparison. The tissue gel composite technique on the bottom produces just one type of signal after treatment, just a single curve. Uh, this, this peak is approximately 100 microns thick, with a T2 time of between 700 and 1,000 microseconds. In contrast, the free solvent technique on the top right produces a more complex data set that can only be correctly modeled by a bi-exponential system, resulting in two types of signal. The lower intensity blue line with a T2 time of between 5,000 and 10,000 microseconds, and the higher intensity green line 
with a T2 time of between 800 and 1500 microseconds. The cyan line dry, drawn above them is simply the sum of the blue and the green lines uh, drawn to suggest the aggregate effect of the treatment. With the free solvent technique on the top, not only is the depth of penetration approximately 200 microns greater than with the tissue gel composite method, but the presence of two different types of signal suggests a fundamentally different interaction between the solvent and the ground. Single-sided NMR has shown that these two different cleaning techniques, free solvent with a swab and Sraal's tissue gel composite method, have different effects on the ground in this model. Not only is the depth of penetration different, but two types of signal appear with a free solvent as opposed to only one type with the tissue gel composite method. The nature of these types of signal cannot be unambiguously described with only these experiments. It is possible that different signal types arise from solvent molecules trapped in differently sized pores within the ground layer. Alternatively, one or both signal types could come from a softened ground layer itself. What is unambiguous is that the observed signals are not free solvent in a bulk state. This particular solvent has a T2 in bulk solution of nearly 70,000 microseconds, much larger than any signal observed with either treatment method. If we are observing solvent directly, it is trapped in some porous matrix and its relaxation is affected by the ground. In conclusion, we have shown that resin plays an important role in, the di in different treatments of paintings and it behooves us to consider its effects for improved risk assessment. In addition, NMR has proven to be a valuable tool to compare selected cleaning techniques. In the future, we plan to investigate the nature of the solvent in a swollen film environment, studying the multiple types of signal that we observed previously. We also suggest the importance of studying cumulative effects of different treatments on samples, as well as performing comparative tests on more realistic and more complicated models. We've got several people to acknowledge, and so as to not give favoritism to mine or Gwen's collaborators, I'll just put the list up and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I think that talk exemplified uh, why it's very nice to have separate working groups coming together to talk together because this is a wonderful example of the paintings group work and the scientific research groups work really dovetailing together. And I think this is a topic that um, demands a lot of discussion, but unfortunately we only have time for <laughs> a very few questions at the moment. But I do hope that during the next two days that there will be more talking with uh, Gwen and with Tyler about uh, these results, which I think open up a whole new uh, place for us to talk about treating, tr treatments and, and developing our methods. And it's very difficult for me to see if there are questions, but there's a hand going up over nearby the microphone, so maybe, oh, it's Narayan, okay. Hi, I'm um, Narayan Kandekar at Harvard Art Museums. I have a, a question about when you re-varnish a painting, because essentially you're putting a bunch of solvent and varnish on there and it's not so different from solvent cleaning a picture. So if you were to put a new coat of resin varnish on your untreated painting, how would that look compared to the one that's been cleaned? Right, so yeah, so if there was a varnish now applied to the painting that was never treated, which we would never do. I mean, yeah, we, we of course have treated this painting since and there was no question, of course, we'd varnish in a painting that hasn't been varnished <laughs> for 400 years. But you mean, yeah, in terms of the effects, well, it's a complicated one because, I mean, it's been shown in, in, in Ken Sutherland's study, for instance, that when you apply varnish, indeed, um, the solvents that you use that, uh, for dissolving that resin can have uh, an, an effect on extracting low molecular weight components into the varnish. Um, and so, yes, it has, it, it's, a, it's a complicated one to sort out in terms of our ongoing experiments and how we actually can clarify the solvent effect from the resin effect. And um, I think we don't know. I think we'll just have to keep you posted on how that might be. I mean, what is for sure is the, the dance painting, the one that was never treated, had no, had no cracks. It had no cracks. And it was the, extraordinary and so when you normally are putting a, a varnish on an old painting that's already been cleaned or has a varnish on it I mean the varnish is going in the cracks of course 
and penetrating through the that way. So for the dance, if you varnished it now, I think probably in 50 years you'd have cracks and you're back to the same problem again. Did that answer your question? Yeah? Okay. Um, Eric, down in front. Uh, well, Tyler, you know I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, <laughs> Uh, my uh, training in NMR theory falls far short of what I need to understand what you're doing. Can you help an old man understand uh, with, you're doing essentially uh, solid state NMR with paramagnetic materials in them. And um, I'm more familiar with T1 than T2 relaxation times. Obviously, your, your data don't seem to depend on paramagnetic ion concentrations within these paint films, and I have no idea why. Um, is there a two-minute answer to that question, or should I buy you a beer? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> um, regarding the influence of the paramagnetic ions, I've studied that briefly and have found no significant effect on T2. So empirically, I can say that think we're okay. In terms of the theory, we should talk some more. Um, the short answer, what's actually happening, basically we're looking at relaxation that's, uh, that's determined by molecular mobility. Things that are moving fluidly, they're tumbling, they're not experiencing couplings, and so they have long-lived states. Things that are fixed, rigid, not moving with respect to one another, they have very short uh, relaxation times, and that's what we're observing. We're observing the presence of the dipolar coupling network between the different spins that then result, it affects the T2. Well, I think that uh, the breadth of those questions shows how much interest has been generated by your work, and I'm sorry we can't talk about it more right now, but I want to thank you both for a really interesting presentation. Thank you.